So welcome to this uh, episode 12 of our story and uh, most likely this will be our final episode for this series also. And uh, today's hero is Robert Millikan and uh, you must have uh, known his name because of his famous oil drop experiment I might have mentioned uh, earlier that he designed this experiment to measure the charge on a single electron. So in many of the universities, Indian universities too, we have this experiment in our MSc syllabus and uh, we enjoy doing it. Now Robert Millikan has uh, uh, done a series of experiments on photoelectric effect and especially after Einstein's work because somehow uh, the physicists that time were very very skeptical about this Einstein idea of uh, localized energy packets in radiation. This is because this interference, diffraction, all those things have established so well that the entire energy of this uh, electromagnetic wave is distributed continuously in the wave front, wave fronts. And so any kind of localization, discretization, going again for that particle model, corpuscle model was very, very difficult uh, for people to accept. And uh, Millikan was a great experimentalist. So just after this uh, 1905, he started designing experiments with uh, all kinds of accuracy demands and any kind of source of error to be eliminated, meticulous experiment he was trying to perform so that unambiguously he could refute the prediction of uh, Einstein that uh, the energy is uh, linearly related to the frequency and all those things from that uh, corpuscle type of model, photon type of model, radiation is composed of discrete energy, quanta, those kind of uh, philosophy, those kind of assumptions. And in this, uh, in this effort, he designed several kinds of operators and then uh, improved upon that, improved upon that and eliminated sources of error and for that he so he was a hardcore experimentalist and I will say that an excellent experimentalist taking care of every minute thing, every minute thing. Finally, he has published this uh, paper in Physical Review and uh, that was in 1916, I will give the reference. And I will be describing a little bit on that paper especially the vacuum tube that he has designed or the apparatus that he has designed has many many very special characteristics. So I will show you that diagram that he has put in his 1916 paper in physical review and then based on that diagram I will describe what it is. So let's go to our screen. So this is that diagram and uh, it uh, says that it is the ninth operators, ninth vacuum tube that he has fabricated. So he was working on it uh, from uh, 1905, 1916 he is writing this paper and uh, nine times he has changed the operators. So you can just see how much he has uh, concerned for uh, removing all sources of uncertainty to the maximum possible. So finally this design uh, comes up and let me explain uh, what it is uh, in the next slide. So here you see on the right side emitter, sodium, lithium and potassium. There are three cylinders mounted on a wheel one is of sodium, one is of lithium and another is uh, 
uh, of uh, potassium he has worked with uh, sodium and lithium and not with potassium though he had planned to do that now this wheel can be rotated to bring the desired cylinder in front of the light source this uh, cylinder on the right on which i have uh, put that line saying that this is emitter that is in the right position the light will come from the right and fall on the its surface now this wheel how to rotate this wheel to bring the other cylinder in this position for that he has a magnetic coupling he has magnetic coils current carrying coils on the outside of this vacuum tube remember this everything that i am showing is inside a large a very good vacuum and all this rotation and everything has to be done inside that tube but then it has to be controlled from outside so from outside he is producing those magnetic fields which he is controlling and then inside also he has the corresponding uh, electromagnets or circuits and uh, using that interaction he is able to rotate this wheel and bring the appropriate emitter in front now on the left also you see electromagnet in fact a diagram shows that yes there is uh, some magnetic thing some coils and some circuits now that knife focus on that knife that i have written a small knife is there and that knife is mounted on uh, some some structure and this electromagnet or the magnetic coils which are there will be used to push this whole structure towards right so what is this all about why this knife is inside the vacuum tube because the photoelectric effect pertains to the surface of the metal and if it is sodium it should be sodium but whatever is that residual uh, air in this uh, tube this uh, metal surface will get oxidized at the surface now if the surface gets oxidized the entire character is changed and uh, you don't have much control gradually it oxidizes and it's a time dependent function so every time the experiment is done and the data taken that surface has to be cleaned and this knife is for that cleaning so the wheel will be rotated and the appropriate emitter will be brought in front of this knife and then uh, from the left uh, magnetic coils this whole structure will be taken towards right and then uh, it will uh, scrap that surface layer from that uh, emitter so those are the kinds of uh, care he is taking so in this slide you can see the path of light that is shown it enters from a particular window from right and this uh, dashed thing where faraday cup is written this is uh, an oxidized copper uh, cylinder in the form of a wire gauze or uh, a mesh and this is actually the collector so this uh, sodium or lithium whichever emitter is used first that is cleaned by that knife the knife is taken back the wheel is rotated so that it comes in front of the light and then the light falls on the emitter and then the electrons which are ejected are collected by this faraday cup which is this oxidized copper cylinder and which is uh, connected to that uh, circuit the electrodes are there in in at the bottom and uh, that is how the whole thing is completed now how much how many electrons are being collected by this faraday cup that is measured and uh, through the current which goes through that uh, emitter circuit and that is how the photo current is measured now in this next slide you see i have written to measure contact potential on one side other side uh, it is oxidized copper and that indicator is on a line where a small in small letters s is written so this is a plate oxidized copper plate and uh, i'll tell on the board what it is all about so let us talk of contact potential 
and this term comes into picture when you have two different metals electrically in contact with each other. So I give you an example. Suppose you have uh, some plate A, metal A, some plate which is made of a metal A, another plate made of plate some other metal say B. So you have two different kinds of metals here maybe uh, one copper, one zinc or any, any two. Now as long as they are not in contact fine but suppose they are put in contact. Suppose this uh, a wire of material B is properly connected between these two. Suppose this is wire of the same metal B. So at the junction, since the two metals are different and they are all electron density, all those things are different, so there is a flow of charge from one to the other and some charge appears here, some charge appears here, positive and negative, equal numbers because total is of course neutral. Alright, so suppose uh, some positive charge is developed here, some negative charge is developed here and if you talk in terms of potential, if this potential is zero, we have not put any battery or any source. This is zero, this is zero, this is zero, this is zero, but right on the other side, we will be K and that we will be K everywhere that we will be, be equal to K everywhere and so on. So this whole thing is at one potential, then there is jump in potential and then this whole thing is at one potential and this potential difference across the junction depends only on the nature of the material, only on the nature of the material, what metals are here and here. Alright, so now is known as contact potential, this K is known as contact potential. And how do you measure, how can you measure? Various ways, one way is that uh, the charge that appears here and the volt that appears, the potential difference that appears here and therefore here. And then you have some capacity. Right? You have some capacitance. So, you will have this Q equal to CV relation. Now, this V is fixed. This V is fixed. This is, this junction will decide how much is this V. Now, if you change the separation little bit, what are you changing? You are changing the capacitance. Yeah, parallel plate capacitor, some epsilon naught A by D. So if you change the separation, the capacitance changes, the contact potential still remains the same, so this will remain the same and therefore this charge will change. You will have more positive charge or less positive charge here and so on. If the charge changes, the discharge, the magnitude of this charge, value of this charge, changes when you are doing the separation, you are changing the separation. That means charge is flowing. Okay? If uh, more charge is coming here, it means some charge is flowing from here. And if it is flowing from here, it is flowing from here. So in the circuit, there will be a current. Now if you can measure that current, and then you can relate how much uh, I am I'm changing the separation and how much current is being produced and therefore how much charge is going in a in, in certain time interval. From those things you can calculate this contact potential. Now that we know that this kind of thing is there, let's look at that photoelectric Einstein equation once again. So let us consider a typical photoelectric effect uh, experimental setup. You have an emitter then you have a collector and a light source and then electrons are coming out and here you have a, a potential potential difference applied between 
this collector and the emitter and this voltage the positive voltage on the emitter so that uh, the electric field is in this direction which will oppose the motion of this electron so it is kind of retarding potential so if this battery or whatever you are using arrangement if this voltage is below suppose this is your grounded so this is v equal to 0 and then you have v equal to v not here and then you say that okay the maximum kinetic energy half in v square which is equal to h times u minus w what function frequency of the light used and then uh, there is the maximum kinetic energy of the electrons so the Einstein equation according to the Einstein equation and if you apply sufficiently large V naught so that these electrons do not reach the collector then the current will be zero to stop the current what is the minimum potential you have to apply stopping potential if that is V naught if V naught denotes this then this half mv square is equal to e times v naught and that is actually minus w and therefore uh, if you plot this uh, v naught uh, on the vertical axis and this frequency nu on the horizontal axis you will get a straight line and the slope of that straight line will be h by e and all those things okay so that is uh, that comes out from the Einstein equation but but the two emitter and collector are of different metals and it should be different metals. Millikan has taken care of which, which material should be here and which material should be here because if you take the two from the same material, then light which is reflected from the walls, if you are sending light, then not all the light is getting absorbed. All right. So a lot of light is reflected from here, from here, from here, from here and if that light falls on the collector, that reflected light falls on the collector and electrons are ejected from this side also, then uh, the equation will not work and so they are dissimilar material. These, these, uh, this frequency should be able to eject electrons from here but the same frequency should not be able to eject electron from here so you have to choose the material uh, properly and Millikan has taken care of all these things okay now if it is dissimilar suppose this uh, this collector and this connecting wires they are of the same material but then this is different so what will happen Potential here is V0, potential here is 0, potential here is V0, potential here is V0, but potential here will be V0 plus K because here we have a junction of different kinds of material, so the contact potential difference will be there. This side it is V0 and therefore on this side it will be V0 plus K. So what the electron will see? Electron will see that uh, there is a potential difference of V0 plus K and hence this V0 should be replaced by V0 plus K and therefore you should have E times V0 and plus K. This should be equal to H nu minus W. This modification is needed. Now Millikan uses this to give a further test to this equation, Einstein's equation. And how? Contact potential can be independently measured using uh, the techniques uh, that I had uh, earlier discussed here, capacitance and then increasing the distance and so on. And he has arrangement for that in his vacuum tube. So contact potential can be independently measured and from the Einstein equation, one can get this uh, contact potential if they match that will have another test for Einstein equation okay so suppose you have uh, a second material here you keep this collector same and then uh, you take emitter number two 
which has a different uh, work function, different pro contact potential from here, but you keep this light set and then find what is the stopping potential. So for that second material, it will be say stopping potential is we you know time when I change the meter and uh, use the same frequency new here, then the stopping potential will be different. Let us say it is V0 prime. Remember this V0, this V0 prime is the is the potential difference that I have applied. We have applied, right? The cell here. So this is V0, and then when I change this emitter, then it becomes this. Contact potential is also different, and this is same, and work function is also different. Now you also know that uh, there is a threshold frequency or threshold wavelength. If the frequency is less than threshold, then the photo emission does not take place. Whatever voltage you apply here, whatever voltage you apply here, you won't have any emission if the frequency of this is less than a minimum. And that can also be independently obtained from the from this uh, setup itself, from the experiment itself. You change the frequency, or you have those frequencies, and then uh, draw some graph uh, and of current versus something, and then you see where where that graph tells that the current will be zero. So that minimum frequency is given by say. W is equal to H times nu naught. This is this is the threshold frequency H times nu naught, which can independently be determined. So if I put it here in place of this W, I write H nu naught. So let me write it H nu naught. And for W prime, I write similarly H nu naught prime. So this is the threshold frequency for emitter one. And this is threshold frequency for emitter 2. Now subtract these equations. What do you get? Subtract. E times V0 minus E times V0 prime. So I am subtracting this from this. Plus E times K and minus E times K prime. This is equal to H nu. H nu cancels out. Okay, so I can perhaps write here itself. And then this minus this, so H here, nu naught prime here, and minus nu naught here. This. And from here you can write what is this K minus K prime. Okay, so if I write E times K minus K prime is equal to H times nu naught prime minus nu naught and then uh, minus E times V naught minus V naught prime like this and divide by this E so you get H by E here and this E goes up. So now this K minus K prime is the contact potential between the material of emitter 1 and emitter 2 because K is the contact potential of emitter 1 with the collector and K prime is the contact potential of emitter 2 with that collector. So if you subtract you get the contact potential between emitter 1 and emitter 2 materials. Okay, so that contact potential can be obtained independently in Millikan's setup, and from this equation, because you can measure nu naught, you can measure nu naught prime, you, can, you apply that to v naught, and you know at what uh, potential it stops the current. So these things are known. So we have two in two different ways. One is direct measurement of contact potential, and then second is from these parameters and these two should be equal if they are equal that means this equation is valid all right so millikan does that also so let me go to screen and discuss it further 
so look at the right side i have written oxidized copper and then this uh, indicator line is going to a plate where s is written capital s is written this is an oxidized copper plate and uh, in order to get that contact potential this will be used as one of the plates and then this particular uh, emitter which is to be used and after it is cleaned using that uh, knife this wheel is rotated and that emitter is taken in front of this plate s so now and then on the red and then on the left side i have written to measure contact potential so you have circuits there so the capacitor is formed between the emitter and this plate s and then uh, by changing the distance between these two and measuring the current in this uh, circuit which i am indicating on the left one gets the contact potential so in the same vacuum in the same vacuum tube in the same setup the surface is cleaned contact potential is obtained and then this uh, emitter is taken in front of the light source and photo currents and other things are measured so that is how he takes care of that uh, contact potential or by knowing the contact potential independently he tests that einstein's equation now this is uh, one of the graphs in that paper it's full of tables and graphs i'm just showing the one which uh, shows you linear dependence of stopping potential with uh, the frequency of light used einstein's equation and uh, see the experimental data are perfectly on straight line linear and from that line slope of that line he has calculated the values of planck constant and it turns out to be very very close which is written in this uh, box in, in handwriting so a lot of data are there the, the variation with uh, this voltage and everything is there but i am just showing the one which is most relevant okay so this is how he ends up in verifying einstein's equation in uh, in a best possible manner with, without any doubt taking care of everything that was there in the world and he he finally verifies it so you can appreciate uh, how well designed was all this apparatus and uh, no wonder it took him 10 years to reach this perfection and uh, in uh, this period many more physicists uh, performed experiments to verify this einstein's uh, predicted law of uh, photoelectric effect but uh, the kind of accuracy the kind of perfection with which millikan did it was uh, suddenly beyond doubt and uh, and therefore the most reliable test and when the actual experiment was performed photo currents were measured stopping potentials were measured frequency he took that uh, mercury lamp and uh, by using proper filters he could uh, use uh, he could stay away with the spray radiation so almost monochromatic light he used and uh, so many lines and so many wavelengths and he took extreme care of uh, what is the stopping potential and, and the threshold frequency and uh, whether this uh, collector is not emitting electrons because of reflected uh, radiation that falls on that everything taken care of and results were in beautiful match with einstein's prediction beautiful match with einstein's prediction millikan was very critical of uh, the theory the philosophy of einstein that uh, radiation energy is localized in uh, different 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 uh, packets hmm, of uh, of h nu so he was absolutely not ready to accept that and even after 
even after the most successful verification of uh, Einstein's equation, Millikan had reservations in uh, accepting that photon theory. I will uh, read some lines from his paper showing his concern about the theory. But then uh, when Millikan himself was awarded Nobel Prize in Physics uh, 1923, for working on the electron, the measuring charge of the electron and doing such a beautiful, wonderful experiment on photoelectric effect. By that time he had, he had uh, accepted or he was convinced that okay, maybe nature is like that. So that is uh, the story of uh, photoelectric effect and uh, once this 1916 uh, this Einstein's prediction was very high, then uh, the scenario changed very rapidly. Although Milliken himself was not convinced, even in the writing of 2000, this is a 1916 paper, I will just read some lines before I, I leave. But, uh, but uh, the scenario changed so fast and people started uh, uh, appreciating Einstein's uh, insight and his uh, ability to think and come out with very bold hypothesis, very different hypothesis, contrary to all beliefs, all predictions and all those things and he was awarded Nobel Prize in Physics 1921, which for which we are now celebrating this centenary year. So thank you very much. I hope this uh, 12 lecture series uh, was useful to you, uh, the knowing the historical perspective, knowing the struggles knowing the commitment, all those things is very inspiring and as science students, as science persons, as science teachers, we, we should imbibe those qualities. Thank you very much. Okay, so before leaving, let me read uh, two sentences from here. This is Millikan's uh, paper, the same paper in which he has uh, tested that Einstein's prediction in the strictest possible test and uh, found absolutely nice agreement and all that. But still in the last section, this is the last section of that paper, he says, perhaps it is still too early to assert with absolute confidence the general and exact validity of the Einstein equation. And in this same paragraph here, he writes, yet, yet the semi-corpuscular theory by which Einstein arrived at this, at his equation seems at present to be wholly untenable. Okay. So that was uh, the scenario of uh, 1916. So you can very well understand the the acceptance and rejections and the struggle of Einstein's theory from 1905 to 1916 at least. And, uh, but then, uh, as I said, the scenario changed so fast that uh, by 1921, it was a very, very established. So thank you very much for attending this course.